All right, are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. All right, three, two, one, let's do it. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In this episode, I speak with the anonymous Twitter user, Macrocephalopod. The arc of our conversation follows the arc of his career, beginning with slow frequency style premium in a hedge fund to building a prop desk that trades mid to high frequency strategies in crypto. A large part of the conversation can be characterized as comparing and contrasting the roles through the lenses of research, operations, and risk management. For example, in what ways is long-short equity meaningfully different than long-short crypto? Or how important are topics like market impact, fill ratios, and borrow fails in mid versus slow frequency strategies? While crypto is the venue, I believe the wisdom imparted in this episode spans all markets. Please enjoy my conversation with Macrocephalopod. Macrocephalopod. Hi, Corey. Great to be on the podcast. Thank you for coming. Really excited to have this one. It's going to be a fun conversation, though I have to dance a little nimbly here to make sure that we're we're keeping you anonymous as you like to be. So I can't do the usual, what's your background starter. So let's start with something a little different. What made you join Twitter? And if you can disclose, where did the macrocephalopod handle come from? Sure. So I joined Twitter in late 2020. But obviously, I've been using Twitter for a long time before that. Right? So I had a real name account from very shortly after Twitter was first founded, and you could make an account. And I used that for a very long time, mostly to lurk, very occasionally to ask a question of someone. And then during 2020, during the pandemic, obviously, there was a lot of work from home, I found myself with more time on my hands, and wanted some entertainment. And also more and more felt like There were people on Twitter who I respect, whose opinion I value. I wanted to be able to speak to them more, discuss ideas that I had, especially ideas around finance, but also general banter. So because of my job, where I work, I felt the best way to do that was with an anonymous account. Obviously, you can see that there are many, many people on Twitter using anonymous accounts in finance for a variety of different reasons. But for me, it was mainly that I wanted to be able to speak a little bit more freely than I thought I'd be able to under my real name because of my job. So I created an account, started posting a little bit of finance content, trading content, quantitative finance, which a few people seemed to find interesting. And yeah, it went from there. Found a really great community of people there. A lot of people posting really interesting content and who seemed to be at least half the time interested in what I had to say as well. And the username... There's no great story behind it. I saw a lot of people had animal-themed accounts. I thought, hey, that's great. What animals do I like? Octopuses are kind of cool. And macrocephalopod, well, I was trading mostly futures and currencies at the time. So I thought I'd stick a macro in front of it. A cephalopod was already taken. So sadly, no exciting story for you about the handle. Well, I understand it at least. So let's go pre what you were doing when you launched the Twitter account. You're talking about trading some futures. We'll get to that. I know earlier in the 2010s from your background, you were actually implementing longer frequency future strategies, a lot of them in the vein of style premia. In our prior conversations, one of the things you said was that looking back, they were very naive strategies and you're surprised that they worked in the first place. Why do you think they worked? And why do you think the alpha has decayed so much since then? Yeah, good question. So I guess I should clarify that we did make money with these strategies. And the kind of strategies I'm talking about are primarily 
daily strategies. So you, you rebalance your portfolio once per day. You typically hold it for weeks to months at a time. You're mostly trading very liquid futures and currency markets, stock indices, bonds and interest rates, commodities. And you are not doing a whole ton of modeling around the details and the microstructure of the market. And you know, you're, to some extent, not thinking about it that much. So why did some of this stuff work? And I can give you a little flavor of the kind of strategies that I was thinking about. So CTA trend following was one example. I spent you know, quite a bit of my early career as a quant researcher working on that kind of strategy. Carry strategies, strategies which now people like to call macro momentum or economic momentum. So looking at the cadence of economic data releases and whether they're surprising to the upside or the downside and trying to build long short portfolios around these ideas. So why do I think they worked in the first place? Well, you know, I, there's a big academic literature on these kinds of strategies. I think there's pretty compelling evidence that at least over the long term, if you're looking back 30 years, they have worked at least in backtest. And there's also quite a long out of sample period of people live trading these strategies and they have made money. You, know, you can look at many, many CTAs with 30 year track records. You can look at futures trading firms, AQR, Winton, who've been around a long time and making money with these kinds of strategies. And I think they work for two reasons. One of which is that many of them have a genuine risk premium there. You are being compensated for taking some kind of risk that other people don't like to take. The classic example of this is a carry strategy where you are just subject to big left tail crashes in essentially every asset class where you try and implement carry, particularly in FX, but definitely in, in rates as well. But also, I think historically, these strategies had a big component of inefficiency in them as well. And that inefficiency came about because there were large barriers to access for these strategies. So it was much more difficult in the past to just get the data you needed to even do the research to see if these, these kinds of systematic strategies worked. Even if you could get the data, it was more difficult to access the market. And there were no nice wrappers for non-institutional players to access the strategies. Right? If you were an individual who wanted to access some momentum strategy, you basically had zero options. Right? You could either try and do it yourself, which is hard, and that was it. There was no ETF which wrapped up a momentum strategy for you or, or gave you exposure to, to value or something like that. And because of those market access difficulties, it meant that people were not paying as close attention as they should have been to the fact that if you just went long currencies with high interest rates and shorter currencies with low interest rates, then you made money with a sharp of like one and a half to two for 10 to 15 year period, which really only came to an end during the financial crisis in 2008. And this kind of explains why these strategies perform less well now. I think like now there is much better access to data, access to markets. These strategies now have the kind of returns which are commensurate with the risks that are being taken. And the kind of inefficiency component has gone away a little. And so I think we were a little lucky. We maybe caught the tail end of some of the, the period where there was still an inefficiency here, but it also coincided with this big explosion of whatever you want to call it, smart beta, liquid alternatives around 2016, 17, suddenly a a lot more capital came flooding into these strategies and competed away a lot of the inefficiencies. And what you're left with is, is the risk premium. And, you know, a risk premium is good. A lot of people should invest in risk premium and, and should probably have more risk premium exposure than they currently have. But yeah, there is a notable decline, I think, in, in the profitability of these strategies over the last 10 to 15 years. So I want to contrast that, though, with another comment you made to me, which was that some of the longer term strategies in equities still seem to work, despite the fact that maybe their parallel concept strategy applied in the futures space doesn't. I'm curious as to why you think they've maintained their edge in equities, but not in futures. Yeah. So I guess the first thing is, is that statement true at all? And it's very difficult to make any concrete claims that it is true or not true. But you know, if you look at what big multi-strategy hedge funds are doing, they are generally putting more of their capital or their risk to work in equity markets than they are in futures markets, implying they think there's a greater opportunity there. And you know, if you're in the position to have access to data and, and run simulations and run back tests, you can see that the performance has held up for some of these market-neutral quant strategies and equities more than it has 
in the macro asset classes. And part of that, I think, is that equity trading is a technically more difficult problem than futures trading. So if you want to do it at scale, you need access to leverage, which means you need financing and prime brokerage. You need to be able to do stuff on swap and you need to be able to handle executing in you know, what is a pretty complex dispersed market, especially in the US. Whereas futures trading, if what you're trying to do is take some positions and hold them for a few weeks or months, that is much more straightforward than in equities. But then another reason I think is that there's a much broader range of names to trade in equities. So you know, many more data points. And also it's generally much more expensive to trade in equities. And I want to elaborate on those a little bit. So if you've got a market which has a small number of names, so let's talk about currencies like G10 currencies, you've basically got nine pairs you can trade and it's very cheap to trade. So typically spreads of less than a basis point to trade G10 currencies. And there's a lot of volume, which there is in essentially every G10 currency pair, then you're really never going to expect to see a lot of alpha in that market right? because it's so easy to access it and you can put on so much size and it's so cheap to trade that anyone who can find alpha is going to deploy as much capacity into that as they can and it's going to compete away the advantages whereas equities you know typically for at least you know, the mid and small cap segment of the market multiple basis points a bit off a spread generally really low volumes you know except for a handful of the biggest names it may be something trades one percent of its market cap per day whereas s p 500 futures like probably trade multiples of their open interest every day. And this combination of lower liquidity and higher transaction costs means that, and this is, this is kind of subtle, you can find good edges in equities if you temporarily suspend reality and get to ignore trading costs. And, and you can find really strong, persistent, predictive edges where you can predict how the price of some stock is going to move. And because there's such a broad universe of names, You've got a lot of data you can use to validate this. You, know, you can really do stuff like taking half your universe, doing your research there, and then saying, does this still hold in the other half of the universe? It's something that you really can't do if you're trading currencies. So you've got a lot more tools to prevent yourself from finding fake effects, like strategies which don't really work. They're just data mined. And you've got this kind of cushion of the trading cost is very high, so you can more easily find predictability. The game in equities is to then monetize that predictability, right? So you know, it's not enough to say, great, I can predict that this stock is gonna move on an average of five basis points whenever X happens. You actually, you know, if that stock costs you six basis points to trade, then there's no p &L to be had there. But by combining lots and lots of these weak edges, which maybe only predict within the bid offer spread, you can get something which looks good after transaction costs in equities, whereas in currencies, your weak edges, you know, if you're trying to predict something over the course of weeks or months, they're very, very weak indeed. And they're so weak that actually it's, it becomes much easier to fool yourself and just find effects that are not really there. This conversation starts to lean into the realm of simulations and research and testing, right? That concept of transaction costs and equities being a key feature as to maybe the limits of arbitrage as to why some predictability continues to exist and persist. This is an area I know you've thought a lot about, not just transaction costs, but just back testing and research and simulation in general. You've written a lot about it on Twitter. You even did a whole series called the 24 days of back test errors, which was a great series. I highly recommend people look it up. My guess is we could do an entire podcast just about back testing. Maybe we'll do that. So, you know, next season, given how much you've written about it, presuming you think it is a useful exercise in the first place, how do you think it's best employed within the research process? And where do you think most folks go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. I, I obviously do think backtesting is a useful tool. And I guess what I would say is that I don't think of backtesting as a research tool so much. Like it, it's not something which is important to me in the research process. For me, the research is what you do before you run the backtest. And then you do the backtest to validate the idea and get some ideas about, well, what is performance going to look like, what a drawdown is going to look like. Maybe you want to test some different portfolio construction ideas and use a back test to do that. But the majority of the research that I do, and then I think a lot of people working professionally in this industry do, is that you spend a lot of time looking at data and building models and testing hypotheses and trying to understand effects before you even think about 
stimulating at all because the first question is, is there something predictable here? And you can go a long way with building some features and doing some linear regressions and getting a prediction out and saying, great, what is the correlation of my prediction with the return over the next two days? And as long as you do those things well, there are a million ways to mess up doing a linear regression before we even get onto how can you mess things up if you uh, use some very modern nonlinear machine learning tool. But you can do a lot before you get to the back test, including which features are going to be useful. You know, once I build a feature, do I need to transform that feature before it's useful in a prediction? How do I combine multiple features into a final alpha? How do I make forecasts or volatilities and correlations of the assets that I'm trading? What are sensible limits to have on position sizes or market beta exposure? All this is stuff you can do before you ever think about your backtest. And then once you've got that, you then take all these inputs that you've created, your alphas, your volatility forecast, your, your risk model, your training constraints, and then you put those through a backtest to say, okay, what kind of performance can I expect with this model that I've created? And your backtest is always going to be optimistic. Right. You know, you know, just because your back test has a sharp of two, you absolutely do not expect to have a sharp of two when you start trading this thing. Apart from all the data mining you've done, you've probably mismodeled a lot of things in your back test. And almost always these errors go against you. Right? It's very rare that you make an error in your back test. And then it turns out when you start trading, you do better than you expected. So the kind of things I would use a back test for, like I say, this final check that the strategy works given a set of assumptions, I would use it to compare different simulation assumptions. So if I have different assumptions around what is my market impact? What are my fill rates? What is my borrow availability? You know, how much do I pay for my borrows or what is my latency? You can use a back test to, for example, make a chart of how does my PNL vary as a function of my latency? Assuming you've, you've modeled everything else correctly, you can change your latency assumption and, and see how latency is sensitive you are. That's something I think a back test is useful for, or, or potentially to compare two different variants of the same strategy. So two different ways of constructing your alpha. So you've got a given set of features. I build two different models for getting a final alpha out of those features. And then I run them both through the same backtest. And you hope that even if your backtest has some assumptions which are not quite true in reality, at least the delta between those two backtests is going to be something which is meaningful. And then finally, a very important thing which we use backtesting for, which I think is a little underappreciated, is reconciliation versus live trading. So at the end of every day or week or month or whatever your frequency is, you run your simulated trading over the day that you just traded, and you say, how well does my backtest match reality? And if there are differences, you really want to understand those differences. That's, that's something we use backtesting for a lot. Another area you've written quite a bit about is factor models and equity factor hedging. Can you talk a little bit about why factor hedging is so critical in a multi-manager equity hedge fund? and how these types of concepts might actually extend to hedging macro factors? Yeah, absolutely. I guess I'm going to be able to take it as an assumption that your audience understands what an equity factor model is and, and what equity factors are. I know you talk about it a lot. So We'll assume that if you don't understand, hit pause, go <laughs> read about it, come back. <laughs> Great. So the idea really of an equity factor model, there the are two parts to it. There's a part that helps you describe risk, and there's a part that helps you model returns. And they're both important. And you know, a quant equity manager will quite likely have a factor model somewhere, even if you know, their strategy is not entirely built as a factor model, there'll be some factor assumptions or factor modeling somewhere within it. And they'll use that both as part of the return modeling process and as part of the risk modeling process. But yeah, I had a, a Twitter thread, I think some years ago now, where I talked about how this can be useful, even if you're not a quant equity market neutral manager. And the situation here is assume you're a big multi-manager hedge fund and you've got a large number of stock pickers who work for you, you know, some trading teams who maybe are sector specialists or country specialists or something like that. And they're, they're quite discretionary. There's some discretionary alpha you're trying to capture with all your in-house stock pickers. And they've, they've got genuine alpha. Right? Like you can look at the returns of some of the big multi-manager funds and you can see there is genuine alpha there. But there's a problem as well, which is that they tend to have, for example, biases to particular kinds of stocks. So the classic thing are that you know, discretionary stock pickers at hedge funds like momentum names, they like quality names, they like strong earnings, they like sales growth. 
I wouldn't say they like short interest, but empirically they tend to pick stocks that have a lot of short interest to be in their short book, partly because that's how stocks get a lot of short interest is that pods at hedge funds short them. And because of this, as the manager running the fund, you end up with a lot of incidental exposures that you don't necessarily want. So big sector or currency or country exposures, market exposures, because a pod manager left to their own devices will go long some high beta name and just do a simple one for one equity index short against it. So yeah, we actually got positive beta after their, their rough hedge, plus all the factor exposures from you know, momentum and earnings growth and things that maybe you want some of that, but you don't want as much as you're getting from the individual stock picks. And so you can put a quant model on top of this and say, okay, what factor exposures do I have? And given my exposures and where I'd like to be, how can I find some cheap hedges for this, this exposure that I don't want? And what I mean when I say you don't want it, well, a really important thing here is that if you've got say 100 different pods, you really care about how correlated they are. And to give a kind of example of this, say you've got 100 different managers building a portfolio and they've all got a sharp of one, say, and they've all got a 20% correlation with each other because they have some similar exposures or similar stocks in their portfolio. And 20% doesn't sound like very much, but that 20% correlation means that if you're diversifying among those 100 managers, the best you can do is double your sharp from one to two by doing that. This is a sort of very simplistic model here. And so say you could reduce that correlation by hedging away some of the factors which are making them correlated. So you can reduce that correlation down to 10%. Then instead of being able to double the sharp, you can triple the sharp, right? Just by getting rid of some of the correlation and then leveraging up a bit. So that's a, you know, a 1.5x boost to your sharp from being able to apply some smart hedging. And you know, if you can get that correlation down really low, if you can get it down to 5%, you can quadruple the sharp of a single manager in the portfolio. And if you can get it down to zero, then the sharp of your portfolio is 10x the sharp of the individuals. Right? And in reality, you can never get this down to zero. But this gives you an idea of you know, even just being able to reduce a correlation between two different trading groups that you have a little bit can be a real boost to your performance. You asked then at the end about how does this apply to hedging macro factors? And I said that's difficult. You know, ideally, you would like to be able to hedge say, your exposure to GDP growth or your exposure to the next inflation print. And if you try and do this in a classic quant way, then you'll get the time series of economic data releases and their surprises. And you say, okay, great, which stocks move a lot when CPI surprises to the upside? Which stocks move a lot when GDP growth surprises to the upside? And try and compute some betas to that. This is an incredibly difficult problem just because there are so few data points. I guess GDP is quarterly, CPI is, is monthly. So you're really not getting enough data to try and estimate this. So a, a better approach, I think, is to try and find proxies for these macro factors, which are higher frequency. So things like the US dollar, the yield on the 10-year, the price of crude oil, and look at betas to these. And this is something you can estimate with a lot more fidelity. And then you can apply a similar idea. You try and hedge out your exposure to these factors if you don't want your energy managers just to be taking a lot of positive oil beta, for example. At one point in your career, you moved from operating in a hedge fund to operating in a prop shop. We often think of those as similar worlds, but I think there are some distinct differences that I'd love for you to talk about. And specifically, how does the change in the structure of a hedge fund versus a prop shop affect the incentives of the people within the firm? And how does that change in incentives affect things like how infrastructure is built or what sort of research goes on? Yeah. So the biggest difference, I think, is that in a prop trading firm, you have more freedom in how the trading revenues can be used. So if you think of these firms as having some claims on that stream of trading revenue that comes in, so you've got your baseline costs, you pay rent, you have infrastructure and data costs, you have legal costs, and they've all got to be paid for no matter what kind of firm you are. And then you have staff, so you, you, know, you have your, your traders who probably expect a percent of P&L or something like that. But then you have a lot of non-trading staff as well, who also need to be paid competitively and who also you know, expect some beta to the firm's performance. And then you've got the providers of capital. So in a hedge fund, that'd be the investors who expect a return on their investment. Obviously, that's why they're invested in the first place. And then you've got the owners slash managers of the firm right, yeah, who are trying to realize some profit either by a dividend or because they're eventually going to sell the firm or something like that. And you've got all these claims. And in particular, there's tension between all of these because you know, there's only a fixed pie to go around. And one big thing 
that you resolve if you're a prop firm rather than a hedge fund is that the providers of capital and the owners of the firm are generally the same people. So a lot of the arguments or tensions that would happen around stuff like how well do we pay our traders or how much of our trading revenue do we reinvest into tech or infrastructure improvements go away because those two groups are the same person. So for example, if you say, right, we want to have a big tech spend this year because we want to buy a load of GPU clusters or we want to spend a lot on cloud compute or something like that. This is work that is presumably only going to benefit many years down the line. And your, if you're a hedge fund, your, your current investors have no real idea whether they're still going to be invested 10 years down the line in time to see these benefits. And so they're going to prefer you, know, you to do less of that reinvestment and for you to pay out more of the profits as, as return to the fund. So that's the biggest difference. And it creates a real culture change inside the firm because I think you end up with everyone feeling a lot more ownership in what's going on inside a prop firm and viewing things a little bit more for the long term is one difference. And then a second difference is that if you're a hedge fund, you are incentivized a little bit to always think about scalability. You've probably got a couple of different revenue sources. You've got your management fee and you've got your performance fee. And if you make the fund 2x bigger, okay, your performance is probably not going to be quite as good because you're larger and you have market impact and it's harder to put the positions on you need. But if your fund gets twice as big, your management fee is just going to double. Right? And that's nice if you're the, the manager of a hedge fund. So you're always incentivized to think about how can I make things bigger? How can I raise more money? And that means that for the people working there, they're you know, constantly being pushed to say, right, how can you do what you're currently doing, but five times bigger, even if it sacrifices the quality of the P&L for that. And that can be nice because there can be bigger paydays, but operating a sharp one strategy is a very different feeling to operating a sharp two strategy if you're the person managing that strategy, right? In terms of the size of your drawdowns and your level of confidence that the strategy is continuing to work. And so if you're a prop firm and you have more of an emphasis on, okay, let's build a quality stream of revenues, you know, some high quality strategies, focus more on the long term. I think it gives a nicer environment for your traders to work in. One of the things you didn't talk about was mandate flexibility, which is, I think, going to lead us nicely into the next part of the conversation I want to go into, because at the prop shop, one of the things that you decided to do in 2021 was help set up a crypto desk, which if you're operating within a large hedge fund with a defined mandate is certainly not something you're going to have the opportunity to do. So talking about the crypto desk, I want to dive into the weeds there. I want to understand when you're thinking about setting up something new like a crypto desk, how does the infrastructure and operational risk of crypto specifically differ from the equities and futures markets? I'd love to know, like, just generally speaking, what lessons did you learn building this desk from scratch? Yeah, so you're right. We, we started building a crypto desk in the first half of 2021, just in time to see a big crash in 2021. Uh, which was great. And obviously in time to see many, many more crashes in crypto in 2022. But yeah, this is still something which we're still committed to. I mean, I'm continuing to run a, a crypto desk today. So there is a huge difference in how crypto markets operate versus how TradFi futures and equity markets operate. The biggest one, I think, is that traditional markets are much more intermediated than crypto markets are you will you know, frequently find that you'll have the exchange and the clearinghouse and the prime broker will all be different firms. Whereas in crypto, typically this would all be the same firm. And this was, and to some extent still is sold as an advantage of crypto, that the crypto exchange is your counterparty, your clearinghouse and your prime broker and your financing provider all at the same time. I think it is now recognize that that creates interconnectedness and fragility that you don't necessarily want. I think the exchanges would still love to be providing all these facilities, but I'm now seeing more of a push to have more intermediation here. Another big difference is that crypto is much more real-time. So you know, if you are taking some losses in your portfolio, there's no prime broker who calls you up toward the end of the day and says, hey, you need to top up your account with some more margin before the open tomorrow you just get liquidated straight away in crypto. So that's something you need to be much more on top of. And it means that your treasury management, which for a 
TradFi trading firm is it's a kind of middle office role becomes much closer to the trading desk in crypto because it's you know there's real edge we call it operational alpha in being able to efficiently manage where your assets are at any point of time to essentially maximize your return on capital another difference is that accessing financing in crypto is much harder particularly post FTX and your internal cost of capital for holding assets on a crypto exchange is much, much higher than it is for holding capital at a prime broker, for example. And you really get concerned about assets which are held at a crypto exchange. So it affects the kind of strategies you want to run as well. Like you, you really only want to run stuff which is high return on capital because you're worried about that capital. And then infrastructure-wise, crypto exchanges, and I think this is a good thing, typically designed to be accessible for much smaller traders than TradFi markets are. So it is absolutely possible, and there are many examples of this, of one person sitting in their bedroom coding up a market making algorithm and going to trade it on Binance or Bybit or OKX or something and, and making money for it. And you know, firms like this have expanded into big teams and become really significant players in crypto in a way which doesn't really happen in traditional markets anymore. But as a result of that, the tech stack on the crypto exchanges looks very different. So for example, the exchange typically runs in the cloud rather than in a data center somewhere. Their method of distributing market data is to send it over a web socket encoded as text, basically, which is an extremely inefficient way to encode market data. There's very high latency because of this. There's lots of randomness and what we call jitter in the latency because of this. So if you are working in an institution and, and you care about stuff like our latency being low or you know having relatively predictable order entry times, you do a lot of work, which you don't really have to do in or it's a different kind of work to the work we have to do in in traditional markets to get an acceptable trading experience so there's a very particular skill set which looks extremely different from the skill set of a trading software developer in traditional markets a lot of those points you touched upon were very much centered around risk and i'd love to dive into that area a little bit more you mentioned for example that thinking about money on different exchanges with a cost of capital. I've, I've heard of firms very explicitly having to think about it as a loan. So whatever money they move to an exchange, there's an implicit hurdle rate of that they have to exceed based upon some sort of risk assumption about that exchange. I'd love for you to just talk about risk management more, maybe contrast it within crypto to more traditional markets, touching on things a little bit more deeply like exchange risk. And then another one that comes to mind for me is sort of that managing the fat tail of line items. Crypto is a space where you get all of these new currencies and derivatives coming to market all the time. Thinking about managing that fat tail, I'd be certainly interested in hearing more about. Yeah, sure. So I think the first thing to say is that since November 2022 and, and the FTX blow up, Everyone, every institution, at least, I think just everyone takes exchange risk much more seriously now. So I think this is something where people kind of had it at the back of their mind, but maybe didn't think about it that much before FTX. And now it's a real primary concern. And this idea of a hurdle rate is something which I've heard of at many, many places trading crypto. If you have a strategy and you think I can make 20% a year on my capital deployed to the exchange for that, you know, even if you can make that with very high sharp, what you're saying is, I need to have five years of my assets sitting at that exchange before I've made enough PL to cover the assets that are at risk. And you know, what do you think the chances are of that particular crypto exchange blowing up at some point in the next five years? So you really care about things like your return on capital. And even more than that, there are some exchanges where I personally, or we as a firm, and I know many other firms, just wouldn't trade on at all, almost no matter what you thought you could get from PL from trading there because you have things like enormous lack of transparency around the corporate structure or the you know, ultimate beneficial owners of the exchange, or you have concerns around very inflated volumes on the exchange, wash trading, self-dealing, the possibility of there being internal trading teams at the exchange who are going to have advantages which are not available to external trading teams. So there are definitely some exchanges where we would not trade which you know, shouldn't be surprising, right? There are hundreds of crypto exchanges, and, but really maybe only 10 or so with decent volumes where an institution would feel comfortable trading. But then even for exchanges where you are comfortable trading, you still have to assign some probability that bad stuff is going to happen at some point there. So that could be fraud. That could be the exchange gets hacked. 
it could just be some incompetence. But yeah, even for a top tier gold plated crypto exchange, there's a chance that something bad is going to happen at some point. Yeah, one which has come up, I guess, more recently, the first few months of this year is regulatory risk. What happens if the exchange gets sued by the SEC or the CFTC? And all these events could result in loss of funds. So you have to mitigate this as best you can. You can never fully remove this risk. You monitor news flow. You monitor wallet movements. You look at volumes on the exchange. You try and spot anything which looks out of the ordinary. And you make your threshold for getting out and just saying, well, I, I'm not happy here. I'm going to remove all my assets from the exchange. You make that threshold as low as you can whilst being consistent with not constantly having to hop your assets on and off the exchange. And then secondly, you just try to have sensible limits on what is the maximum amount of my trading capital that I'm going to put on any one exchange. And I think yeah, no one sensible would ever now have 100% or even 50 or 25% of their capital all at one exchange. Certainly not if they, they thought they couldn't afford to lose it. And then, yeah, the other dimension of this is the very large number of line items that you accumulate in your book, especially if you're running some kind of systematic strategy or doing any kind of fast trading. So, you know, we, for example, run a long, short, market neutral crypto book with hundreds of different underliers in the book. And, you know, any underlier could have multiple different derivatives contracts referencing it, or you can have the same token held at different exchanges, which they can trade at different prices. So in some sense, even though they are to some extent fungible, to some extent, they're not as well. You can't always move a crypto asset between two different exchanges smoothly. And the other thing is that crypto assets are very volatile, right? So you've got this big long short book, you've got a lot of names in it. These things have annualized volatilities in the triple digits normally, so high that when we're talking about this, we normally just quote daily volatilities. So you're talking about daily volatilities in the range of 5 to 15%, which means these things can easily move 25 or 50% over the course of a day. Like that's not uncommon. And it's definitely not unheard of for something to go to zero or to go up in price 10 times within a very short span of time. And this is kind of okay on the long side of your book. You know, if you have 1% of your book in a coin which goes to zero, then you're down 1% and that sucks, but it's very survivable for you. But if you have 1% of your short book in an asset which goes up 10 times in value over the space of two hours, that's a 10% loss in your book. And you're probably trading this thing with leverage as well. I see your it sounds slightly insane to trade an incredibly volatile asset with a lot of leverage, but you're counterbalancing it against your desire to not hold a lot of collateral on the exchange because you're worried about something bad happening at the exchange. So you maybe have three or four or five times leverage in your book. And so if you have a short position, which is 1% of your book, and it goes up 10 times in value, and you're trading with five times leverage, that's half of your trading capital on the exchange gone in a single market move. So we worry a lot about this, and, and we have pretty tight limits overall on how big we're ever going to allow a single position to be in our book. And we'll aggressively start getting out of stuff if we think there's a big danger in an individual name. In our pre-call, you said one of the primary differences between crypto and equities is that equities, even when you're talking about higher frequency strategies, can still be characterized by their fundamentals. And that's something that's not necessarily the case in crypto. Can you explain what you meant by that comment and, and why you think it's an important insight? Yeah, it comes down to how you want to measure and, and characterize risk. So in equities, you have, as well as market data, you've got a lot of fundamental data on every name that you trade. You know that it's part of a specific sector or, or subsector. You know, it trades in a particular country, in a particular currency. You have balance sheets and income statements, which you can analyze. You probably have quite a large amount of analyst coverage of the stock. And that's on top of all of the like market data, trading data, positioning data that you have for, for anything with a price. And you can synthesize this data to try and understand which stocks are likely to move together even before you start looking at any data or any prices. Whereas in crypto, you largely don't have fundamentals. I don't think this is a controversial statement to make, you know, apart from stuff like this is a dog coin. The narratives which cause different assets to move together are largely invisible to you if you're just looking at prices. Often these narratives are just manufactured narratives. You know, a few months ago, there was a lot of talk about potential deregulation of crypto in Hong Kong, what people called the China narrative. And this meant that a you know, small subset of coins which were associated with this started to move together very strongly. But there's nothing really which could have predicted that just by analyzing prices beforehand. 
And yeah, crypto, so, so mostly all you have is price. And if you're trying to understand what kinds of assets are going to move together in the future, more or less the best thing you can do is look back at what happened in the past. So your ability to kind of build models for managing risk is much lower in crypto, I think, than in equities. Well, to that point, sort of as a follow-on statement, you said when you're forming baskets on momentum, there is often some fundamental thing that's underlying those moves that you haven't captured in your other factors, true in both traditional finance and, and crypto. And I think the China example you gave is probably a very pertinent case where there was a fundamental narrative that all of a sudden caused these cryptocurrencies to all start moving together. So hoping maybe you could talk a little bit more about that idea of why you think momentum is a really important risk factor to consider whether you're trading momentum or not. And then I'd love if you can to even tie it back to your comments about managing the short side, talking about that short risk when all of a sudden a large number of that fat tail that perhaps you're short could start behaving in a very correlated manner. Mm. Yeah. So as you said, this is an idea which applies to all asset classes. Now, it's definitely not specific to crypto or even equities. It kind of applies everywhere. And the fundamental insight is that assets always move together for a reason, even if that reason is something which is invisible to you. And that reason is likely to persist into the future as well. So it may be mysterious to you why 10 seemingly unconnected stocks have all suddenly started to move together, but you know, maybe someone who understands that they are all stocks held with enormous leverage by a hedge fund or family office who is now unwinding their positions, for example, like to pick something not quite entirely at random. So if you're a quant manager, you probably have some kind of model, fundamental model, factor model, which describes the exposures of the stocks you trade to some more underlying fundamental factors. And the ideal situation is that after accounting for the correlated moves due to these factors, the residual component of those stock returns, so the idiosyncratic component, is completely uncorrelated between individual names. But in practice, that is almost never the case because your model for what exposures you have and how assets move together is not complete. You've got gaps in it, there are things you haven't considered. So when you form baskets based on just a very simple idea of stuff that has moved together in the past. So a momentum basket is an example of this. It's a basket which is long the stuff, which is up a lot, and short the stuff, which is down a lot. You're, to some extent, grouping based on these kind of latent hidden explanations of why prices are moving. And this is particularly true if you are neutralizing the understood factors first. So, you know, for example, if you just kind of naively go out and say, okay, I'm going to buy the stocks that went up and I'm going to short the stocks that went down, well, this is going to be driven primarily by things like high beta stocks versus low beta stocks, or cyclicals versus defensives, or you know, if it's the last month or so, like whether a stock is a bank or not. And that's not going to be maybe super informative. But if you kind of remove the effects of you know, sector, so you sector neutralize before you start forming these baskets, or you remove the country exposure, you remove their value or quality exposure first, and then you form momentum baskets on the residuals of that, you're capturing more of that hidden factor. And that factor, even though it was something you didn't know about, is likely going to exist in the future. And it's likely going to continue moving prices in the future. And those stocks which move together are likely going to continue moving together into the future. And you can see this in the data, right? So baskets which you form on past momentum, past price moves, have much higher realized volatility in the future than baskets you form randomly, even when you've removed all the sector and factor exposure, exactly because you're picking up a loading on some meaningful risk that drove past returns. So that's, that's something which you really want to know about if you're doing any kind of quantitative trading. One of the things that changed to the arc of your career is that you've gone from focusing on longer term strategies to what you would call mid frequency strategies. So first, I would love for you to define what you think a mid frequency strategy is. I often find in talking to quants, the definitions of high, mid and low frequency actually aren't, aren't consistent as an industry. And then so define what mid frequency is, and then what you think the key differentiators are between mid frequency, high frequency, and low frequency alphas. Sure. I'm going to be a little annoying and define mid-frequency by what it isn't, by what it is. So I'd say high frequency is where you care about every tick and whether or not some liquidity was added at the fifth level of the order book is a real meaningful thing to you and you care about that a lot. And low frequency is 
where you are executing daily or perhaps twice a day, you know, in the opening and closing auction or something like that. And the mid frequency basically captures everything in between. So mid frequency trading, you're not caring about every tick, likely using some form of bin data, second bins or minute bins or hour bins, something like that. But you are trading continually throughout the trading day. And you're typically holding positions for somewhere between a few minutes at the very fast end to a few weeks. Okay, but typically not seconds and typically not months. And it's a different skill set from either high frequency or low frequency trading. And it's a different infrastructure as well. So you typically have a lot more data than you would ever have with a, a daily strategy. And that normally means, you know, unless you're willing to sit for hours waiting for your simulations to run, it normally means you probably want some kind of parallelization infrastructure to make your research go faster. You possibly want some form of specialized data storage so that you can load up data quite quickly. So there's a more technological component than, than with low frequency trading, but it's way less technologically intensive than high frequency trading is where just to manage a single day of market data for HFT, you're probably talking about very specialized data storage structures, which are not quite necessary for mid frequency. How does the research process differ when you're talking mid frequency versus slower frequency signals? More specifically, is it a completely unique and differentiated set of strategies that emerge at the higher frequency? Or do you find that it's largely the same signals, just somewhat faster? So for example, instead of trading momentum over several days, it's now intraday momentum. Yeah, there's a lot that is in common between mid frequency and either slow or faster styles of trading. So, you know, an example you gave, which is great, is exactly like you will measure momentum instead of measuring it over, was it 12 months, get one month that often gets used in momentum studies for daily models. We'll look at it intraday or maybe over a few days. We'll look at, you know, reversion on the order of minutes rather than reversion on the order of days. But a lot of the same ideas can still be applied. I guess it's maybe more interesting to talk about what doesn't really translate across. So anything that has a low frequency of data updates is something which doesn't really translate from low frequency trading to mid frequency. So if you are building your strategy around quarterly earnings announcements, that's unlikely to be that relevant for mid frequency just because you know most days there isn't an earnings announcement. Or if you're building around economic data releases, or building it around analyst revisions to a stock. Maybe it's kind of in between. Most of the time, there isn't analysts revising their rating on a stock. But when it does happen, sometimes it does happen in the middle of the trading day. And then I'd say the other style of trading, which or the other kind of research you would do for low frequency, which doesn't translate over so well to mid frequency, is anything which uses an extremely broad universe. Okay, so anything where you're looking at the very long tail of very illiquid stocks, which you know maybe you can build a slow equity strategy, which builds into those positions very slowly over time. And you hold in your book many multiples of the ADV of that stock, but you're okay with that because you're going to hold it for six months anyway. That doesn't really work for mid-frequency. You mostly want to be able to get out of your positions intraday if you can. And so you end up looking at a, a narrower universe. And that means some long taily strategies or strategies would really only work in the nichiest, most illiquid stuff you don't really look at for mid-frequency. And then things which you would look at in mid-frequency, which you wouldn't look at so much in, in low-frequency, is anything to do with microstructure. So what does the order book look like? What does the you know, short-term trade flow look like? And you know, these are all things where you would care a lot about them for high-frequency trading as well. But I think the difference is probably that in high-frequency, you care about the individual events a lot more. So, you know, you care a lot about, okay, a trade just happened at this price level at this exact time, and that's going to affect my forecast in the following way. Whereas mid frequency is more about what is the general trend of order flow at this time. As frequency goes up, one of the things that people tend to focus on as being a more important contributing factor to PL is transaction costs, right? Those transaction costs often increase. I'd love to get your thoughts on how you think about modeling things like slippage, particularly in crypto where you're talking about a variety of exchanges and crypto prices tend to be impacted 
by block time, right? Congestion in the network is going to impact both decentralized and potentially the ability to arbitrage on centralized exchanges. Seems like that would have a more profound impact on potential slippage during extreme market environments than perhaps traditional markets. Yeah, so you're absolutely right that your focus on transaction costs and in particular market impact slash slippage becomes very important as you're looking at faster and faster trading. In fact, I'd, I'd say be even more extreme than that. In some markets or for some strategies, slippage completely dominates your trading costs. Right? It's, it's a bigger by an order of magnitude compared to the fee you're paying or the bid offer spread. And naive modeling of market impact leads to assumptions like, well, you know, I've got a large trade to do, but I can just split it into 10 small chunks and execute them you know, equally over the next 10 minutes with a very small amount of market impact in, in each, each little bin that I trade in. And stuff like that leads you to write back tests and simulations, which are not very reflective of, of reality. And market impact, it's kind of nice. It's, it's something where there is actually, I think, a pretty good academic literature on it because people tend to view it not so much a component of their alpha as part of their edge. So they're much more willing to publish on it. And so you can go read this literature and there are really interesting puzzles to resolve like, okay, we know trading causes price impact. And we know that after large trades, prices tend to revert a little bit as the market absorbs some of that flow. And we also know that order flow tends to be very correlated in time. So that if you see a lot of aggressive buying in one time period, you're likely to see aggressive buying in future time periods. And the time lag on this can be extremely long. It can be weeks or months. You can observe some strong buy pressure today, and that can give me a prediction that like two months from now, there's going to be slightly stronger buy pressure than average. But even though that order flow is, is correlated and is extremely predictable, prices themselves don't seem to be that predictable, even though the order flow impacts the price. So yeah, how do you resolve this? And if you're trying to model this yourself, you've got the, you know, and, and you're working at a hedge fund or a prop firm, and you've got your own trades, and you're saying, okay, what is the market impact of my trades? You've got the double problem that you traded, presumably, because you had some alpha, and your alpha was going to predict that the market would move in the direction of your trade anyway, even if you didn't trade. And if your alpha is good, then indeed it would have moved that way. So how do you disentangle the effect of the market impact you had by trading versus how much the market was going to move anyway, just because you predicted that it would? So yeah, it's, it's a fascinating area to study. It's interesting to try and incorporate it into a simulation as well, because a cute little fact is that empirically, we see that the market impact of a trade of a certain size follows what people normally call a square root law. So that the size of your market impact is proportional to the square root of your participation in the market over the time period that you traded. And then if you go and implement this in backtest, and you say, okay, there's some market impact, which is proportional to the square root of the trade, and then it decays slowly over time, you'll quickly find that this is very, very arbitrageable in the sense that you can just write a strategy, which in simulation does lots and lots of small trades in the same direction and builds up some market impact over time. So say you buy, 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 buy successively, you push the price up, and then you just do a big sell trade into all that price impact you've created. And your big sell trade, because of the square root law, doesn't move the market down as much as your previous buys moved it up. And, and you can just buy something which in simulation is profitable. So it's, it's a, I like it. It's a weird example of what seems to empirically fit the best. In some sense, cannot be correct. There's some missing factor. Uh, and I'm trying to untangle this is something that you know, I've personally spent a lot of time on and found very interesting. I love that example. And it highlights how modeling has many inherent limitations, right? You can find these edge cases where the model might work in aggregate, but certainly if you take it to its weird logical conclusion, you can come up with this example where you can create your own arbitrage over time. And I think it brings our conversation full circle back to the beginning about conversations around using backtesting, not as a research tool itself, but as a testing tool. Other things that seem to be more important in the mid frequency range, and, and I I want to sort of talk about these and get your thoughts through the lens of how important they are in the simulation and the back test are things like estimates of market impact, your fill ratios in your trades, borrow fails on the short side versus your expected alpha. How accurate do you need to be in your estimates of, of those sort of details to really make sure that your strategy has legs? The short answer is that you end up needing 
to model these things very accurately. And I say end up because you can often start with some relatively poor assumptions here. And as long as your strategy is small compared to the market, then maybe you can get away with that. So you can get away with assuming that you don't have that much market impact and that your trades always get fully filled and that your locates always get filled and you can short as much as you like at reasonable fees. But then, you know, if that strategy ends up being profitable, you're inevitably going to want to scale it up. And as you try and scale things up, the failures in your modeling become more and more apparent and then become much more important. And you'll notice this because your, your simulation will be saying, great, this strategy should be really performing right now. And then in your live book, you're just losing money hand over fist. So while you can, in some circumstances, get away without modeling that stuff, if you're going to be successful and you're going to try and push your profitable ideas to the limit of how much you can extract out of them, you end up having to be much better at all this kind of modeling. But it's nice because you, know, you get more data which you can use for your modeling as you push the size of your portfolio and as you trade more. It's a little bit of a chicken egg problem because you want to, for your simulations, you want to say, well, how would my strategy look if I sized everything up two times and traded double the volume that I'm doing now? And you don't have the data to fit a model there. You, know, you have to extrapolate from a different regime. And it's not until you actually push to that larger size of trading that you get the data you need to make your model more accurate. So you're always in this process of trying to push your assumptions right to the edge of what you can do with the tools and the data you've got available to you. Going to maybe the other side of the coin, we, we spent a little bit of time talking about maybe the fixed costs and risks. I want to return for the end of the conversation to some thoughts on alpha. Where do new ideas come from? And how has that changed as you've changed the time horizon of the alphas that you've been working on? I used to predominantly get my ideas from reading papers, whether that meant academic papers or industry papers or cell side research, which I think is still a great way to get ideas when you are starting out. But then when you've been doing things for a little while, you realize that there's a, a lag between industry practice and the paper getting written. And that lag is something like five to 10 years, which makes a lot of sense when you consider that you know someone discovers an idea, that idea then has to percolate within industry, and then it has to escape into academia or onto the sell side. And then someone has to collect the data and write the paper and the paper has to get published. But right? you can easily get five to 10 years of, of lag by doing this. So once you're at the level where your own research is at or has surpassed the level of what you can read about in papers, You've then more or less, I think, exhausted those as a source of new ideas, and you have to find other places to get, to get new ideas. And there's a few places where I get ideas from. So one is new data sets. So yeah, whenever I hear about a new data set becoming available in an area that's relevant to me, I want to jump on that, like try and get as much of that data as I can, understand it, see if there's any value in it. Because just sometimes hearing about a new data set, like a piece of data you didn't know existed, gives you an idea for a, for a new piece of research you can go and do. Just watching the market. Is another decent source of new ideas, particularly in HFT. I think yeah, just having a really good order book visualizer so you can see how the market evolves over time can be a useful source of edge. Because you just get to watch how prices form and you know, see uh, new orders entering the book and then try and construct your own understanding of who put this order in, why were they doing it, why did they trade at this price, and, and build a model of how other market participants act. And that's something you only really get from what I'm going to call watching the market, which doesn't necessarily mean watching the market in real time. It might mean you know, going over historic data and replaying it and zooming in and, and, and trying to understand what happened. And then a third really great source of new ideas is by thinking about our own trading and talking to other traders. So what I mean by this is that say we have some problem to solve. like We want to trade 2% of a stock's ADV. We want to do that in a way which is not going to cause too much market impact. And well, we will execute that flow in some particular way. Maybe you know, we'll have a proprietary market making algorithm which tries to get into it passively, or we'll have some spread crossing algorithm which tries to get it aggressively. And then you go one step further and you think about what effect is that going to have on the market and how could someone who's on the other side try and take advantage of that? And you can say, well, okay, if I'm if I'm thinking to execute my trades in this way, there's probably someone else who's thinking along similar lines. And how can I try and identify their trading pattern in the market and you know, use that in a predictive way? And as well as thinking about your own trading, you can talk to other people about the problems they have trading. 
And you know, when you're talking to other traders, sometimes someone will just drop some legitimate alpha on you, like out of the blue, because they're trying to brag or they want to impress you or they think you already know it. And that could be great. But mostly what happens is that they'll have some offhand comments that triggers some interesting thought process on your side that after much research leads to a new idea. So I think it's really worth spending the time to talk to a lot of people about their own trading, about the problems they have, about how they try and solve those problems, because that's, for me now, a big source of new ideas. Last question of the podcast for you. Listeners at this point in the season know that our cover art is inspired by tarot cards, and I'm having every guest pick their own tarot card to design their cover. And you chose the card for strength. Again, I think like most guests and like me going into this season, you had no experience with tarot cards before. But my question to you is what drew you to choosing that card? Strength. Yeah, mostly because it's card number eight in the tarot card deck. And I thought card number eight was appropriate for uh, anonymous internet octopuses. It's as good an answer as there's going to be. Well, Mr. Octopus, thank you for joining me. I think folks will get a ton out of this interview. I appreciate you breaching your anonymity a little for me. I think this will be a fantastic episode. Thank you very much, Corey. It's great to be on. Mm -hmm.